Hello and welcome to the sixth video in the A-Level Biology series. Today we are going to cover immunity, looking at key players and events in the immune response to control disease. Immunity describes the ability to identify the presence of foreign materials such as pathogens in the body and respond by directing specialist cells and cell products to combat the invading pathogen. White blood cells are crucial players in the war against invading pathogens. There are a few different types of white blood cell, each with a different mode of action. There are phagocytic cells called neutrophils and macrophages, and lymphocytes, which are divided into two types, B lymphocytes, also known as B cells, and T lymphocytes, also known as T cells. White blood cells are produced in the bone marrow from differentiation of stem cells. Myeloid stem cells differentiate into red blood cells, neutrophils, monocytes and platelets. The lymphoid stem cells differentiate into lymphocytes or white blood cells. Let's cover each cell type in more detail. Phagocytes destroy pathogens by phagocytosis, which is the process of recognising and engulfing the pathogen. This is considered a non-specific immune response because any pathogen or foreign material can be engulfed. Firstly, a phagocyte encounters a pathogen or foreign body. The phagocyte engulfs the pathogen and traps it within a phagocytic vacuole. The phagocyte secretes digestive enzymes into the vacuole and digests the pathogen. Neutrophils? These are short-lived cells and they die after engulfing and destroying the pathogen. Neutrophils travel through the body in the blood and are squeezed out of capillaries and into tissue fluid. Neutrophils are attracted to the site of invading pathogen or the site of infection by chemical signals from the pathogen or from damaged cells. Histamine is an example. This type of attraction and movement is called chemotaxis. Macrophages. These are larger than neutrophils and are comparatively long-lived cells. They are produced as monocytes in the bone marrow and travel in the blood as monocytes. They later mature into macrophages when they leave the blood. They move into organs such as the liver, lungs, spleen and kidneys. Macrophages do not destroy the pathogen. Instead, it cuts it up into fragments and displays part of the pathogen or an antigen on its own surface. The displayed antigen is identified as an invader by lymphocytes, triggering an immune response against any cell carrying this antigen. Lymphocytes. These cells play an important role in the specific immune response. They are produced before birth and contain a nucleus which takes up much of the cell. There are two types of lymphocytes, B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes which have different modes of action. B lymphocytes, or B cells, mature in the bone marrow and then spread throughout the body, concentrating in the spleen and lymph nodes. B cells produce specific proteins called antibodies in the presence of a foreign antigen. Each B cell encodes a specific antibody with each binding of a different antigen. Therefore, we have millions of different types of B cells in our bodies. The antibody remains on the surface of the B cell, forming a glycoprotein receptor, which bonds to one type of antigen. T lymphocytes, or T cells. Immature lymphocytes leave the bone marrow and travel to the thymus, where they mature. Mature T cells have a specific protein receptor on their cell surface, known as the T cell receptor. T cell receptors are like antibodies in which they are specific to each antigen. Activated T cells divide by mitosis to increase in numbers, then differentiate into two different types of cells, helper T cells and killer T cells. 
Helper cells release chemicals which activate phagocytes and T-killers to destroy abnormal or foreign cells. T-cells get activated by binding to antigens presenting on the surface of the host's own cells, such as a macrophage after engulfing a pathogen. Antibodies are globular glycoproteins, also known as immunoglobulins. They have a characteristic Y-shaped 3D quaternary structure, which consists of two heavy polypeptide chains and two light polypeptide chains, joined by disulfide bridges. Each chain has a constant and variable region. The end of the variable region is highly specific and is around 110 to 130 amino acids in length. And this is where the antigen binds. The antibody has two binding sites for antigens. This allows multiple pathogens to be clumped together, which is known as agglutination, which is advantageous for phagocytes, which have a larger target and can destroy more than one pathogen at a time. When an antigen enters the body, the B cell with the complementary cell surface antibody will recognise it and bind. Once this occurs, the B cell undergoes clonal expansion when the cell repeatedly divides by mitosis. The resulting daughter cells differentiate into two different types of B cell. A plasma cell or a memory cell. Plasma cells secrete the antibodies in response to the threatening antigen. They can then bind to the antigen and even neutralize, inhibit or destroy it. Plasma cells are identical to B cells and they secrete lots of antibodies which are specific to the offending antigen. Memory cells remain in the immune system for a longer time and so if the pathogen is encountered again, the immune response is faster. The immune response is split into two, the cellular and the humoral response. The cellular response involves T cells and other immune cells they interact with, such as phagocytes. The humoral response involves B cells undergoing clonal selection and producing monoclonal antibodies. These responses are both required to remove pathogens from the body. For example, T cells help activate B cells for antibody production and the coating of pathogens with antibodies makes it easier for phagocytes to engulf the pathogen. The immune response for antigens can be memorized so that the immune response can be quicker the next time the pathogen with a known antigen is encountered. Therefore, there can be two levels of immune response. The first is a primary immune response and a secondary immune response can occur if you're exposed to the same pathogen again. The primary immune response is the initial activation of the immune system upon recognition of a foreign antigen. The primary response is slow because there is currently not enough B cells to produce the required antibody. Eventually, through clonal expansion, there will be more B cells to produce the correct antibody to overcome the disease. However, during this time, the infected person will show signs of infection. After exposure to an antigen, both B and T cells produce memory cells, which will remain in the body for a long time after the infection is cleared. Memory T cells will remember the specific antigen and will recognize it quicker next time it is encountered. Memory B cells act as a record of the specific antibodies required to bind to the antigen. If the same antigen enters the body again, the immune system will produce a faster and more intense response. Due to the memory T and B cells still patrolling the body, the antigen will be recognized quickly. Memory T cells will divide into the correct T killer cell to kill the cell carrying the antigen. B cells will divide into plasma cells which produce the correct antibody to bind and neutralize the antigen. This response is fast, so the pathogen will be destroyed before symptoms start to develop. This graph shows the concentration of antibodies and hence the immune response over time. This shows the difference in intensity between the primary immune response, 
when the pathogen is encountered for the first time, and the secondary immune response, when the pathogen is encountered again. There are two types of immunity when discussing immunity, uh, passive immunity and active immunity. Passive immunity is when you gain immunity from being given antibodies made by a different organism. Natural passive immunity is when a baby becomes immune due to antibodies being passed on through placenta and breast milk. Artificial passive immunity is when you are immune after being injected with antibodies from someone else. Active immunity is the type of immunity developed from your immune system synthesizing its own antibodies after recognizing an antigen. Natural active immunity is your immune system's natural response to and inviting infection. Artificial active immunity is immunity gained from being vaccinated with a harmless dose of antigen which triggers the immune system. So passive immunity does not require exposure to an antigen. The protection is immediate, no memory cells are produced, and is short term due to antibodies being broken down. Active immunity requires exposure to antigen, takes a while for immunity to develop, produces memory cells, and gives long term protection from a pathogen. As we have covered in this video, the active immune system relies on the recognition of an antigen as pathogenic or non-self. Every cell in the body has markers for identification, so it can be identified as self, so the immune system will not attack it. Microorganisms have unique markers or antigens, but because they were not produced in the body, they are considered non-self and they can produce an immune response upon recognition. The recognition of self and non-self antigens is important to ensure the body does not attack its own cells, resulting in tissue destruction. However, some diseases are caused by the immune system being triggered accidentally by self antigens. This is called autoimmunity. Normally during T cell maturation, cells which have incorrect T cell receptors, which complement self antigens, are destroyed. However, in some cases, they evade destruction and become activated by self-antigens. Examples of illnesses caused by this are diabetes, in which one organ is targeted, the insulin-producing cells of the pancreas, and whole body autoimmunity, such as lupus, which affects skin, joints, and kidneys. These cases are not uncommon and show us how powerful and essential our immune systems really are. Thank you for watching today's video. We hope to see you next week to continue looking at antibodies and vaccines in fighting infectious disease.